This is Joe Galloway conducting an oral history interview with James Campbell on January 28, 2020 at 1.30 p.m. We're located at the Community Center at Española Park in Bunnell, Florida. Sir, before we begin, could you please state and spell your first and last name for the transcriber? James, J-A-M-E-S, L, Campbell, C-A-M-P-B-E-L-L. -L. Thank you. Before we talk about your time in Vietnam, I'd like to get some biographic information. Where and when were you born? I was born in 19, uh, February 21st, 1947, in Lake Wales, Florida. And who were your family members? My mother was Lucille Allegood Campbell. My dad was Herbert Hoyt Campbell. And my brother, I have one brother, and his name is David Allen Campbell. And what did you consider your hometown? Where did you go to school? Orlando. Orlando. In, Orlando. in College Park area, which is right just north of downtown. Yeah. Uh, how did you come to enter the military? Say that again. How did you come to enter the military? I was drafted. You were drafted. Yes. What year? That was in 67, 1967. And... Uh, September, I believe it's September of uh, 67. Vietnam War was well underway. Well underway, yes. And did you have a good knowledge of what was going on over there? I knew uh, that what was going on over there, that's the conflict between the VC, the Viet Cong, and the, and the people there, and that we had been involved with this conflict for quite a few years. Yeah. Now, uh, you get your draft notice, yes, sir. and I understand you made a declaration of uh, conscientious objection. Yes, sir. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, and I was born and raised that. And um, my mother, we went to church. Mom was a godly woman, and she believed in everything uh, about, about God and about heaven and about the Seventh-day Adventist church. And we the were Adventists looking. were against the war. Well, yeah, they were against it, but, we, you know, I felt like that we had to go do our duty for the U.S., mm -hmm. for the good old USA. So what were your choices then? Well, there were the what they call the white coats. Well, I call them guinea pigs, that uh, you could go in there and, uh, and they'll give you shots and try out new medications on you or you could be, you know, in Washington. I had two of my buddies I grew up with uh, that were in the white coats, they call them, but they were guinea pigs. They'd give them a shot, see how they reacted to it, or if they, one of them got a placebo, one of them just got uh, a shot of the regular stuff, and one would get sick. They never knew which one was gonna get sick. And They uh, have lasting effects from that? Uh, not too much, but they, they didn't make them sick. I know that. <laughs> they, they... Now, so that's one choice. What's the other choice? Go do what you have to do to take care of the U.S. And in your case, that was? That was to go in as a conscious objector. I did not carry a weapon, uh, but once I got over there and some of the conflicts that I was in, some of the, the areas I, were at, I was at, I was forced to because it was the gun or die Yeah, that quick. Where did you do your basic training? At Fort Sam, Houston in Texas. Uh, we, were, we went to, to uh, basic training there and then, then into uh, the medics. Medic training. Our medic training, yes sir. Now, describe your MOS combat medic. What, do, what does that mean to a civilian? To, to a civilian, that means that you were the doctor, nurse, whatever need to be taken care of on the battlefield. On the wherever, battlefield. Wherever you were at. And you went with the soldiers or? I went as looked like one. We were not allowed to wear any patches, nothing uh, that uh, would give us away as far as a medic or your rank. Um, and. Uh, 
you took care of whatever what the guys got wounded or got sick, you took care of them. What was your formal training like? Uh, Compared, say, to a nurse. Well, they went. They put us through 16 weeks of medic training, and I had grown up in the medical field at home. Uh, my aunt was a nurse. My mother worked in a doctor's office, uh, and uh, so I knew quite a bit about it. And I had, I didn't want the military to know it, but I had had studied and passed my apprenticeship to become a mortician at a no. funeral home, and no. so. You didn't want them to put you in the Graves <laughs> Registration. I didn't want to go to Graves Registration. No, sir, I did not. They found out about it later, but I didn't tell them off of it. <laughs> uh, was there additional training you received before deploying to Vietnam? Um, just the basic stuff. You know, the basic kind of jungle stuff. school or right, something like yeah. that. And they sent us out to uh, a camp out from uh, Fort Sam there, and we trained at night how to find our way back, how to uh, maneuver in the, in the jungle, or in, not in the jungle, in the, out there it was nothing but desert where we were at. But yeah. it, you learned a lot, and you had a, you know, I was in what they call the Pathfinders, or like the Boy Scouts, and I had learned growing up a lot about how to do the, take care of yourself and what to do situations. How did you get to Vietnam and where did you land? They took us, I left Orlando and went to Fort Lewis, Washington, traded my uniforms and clothes for jungle fatigues and warm weather clothes and they flew us by commercial airline uh, to Cameron Bay. Cameron Bay is yes, where sir. you landed. Yes, sir. What were your first impressions when they opened the door on that plane? Why, what the hell have I got myself into? <laughs> <laughs> no, it was, uh, it was strange. Uh, as I look back and as I think about it over the years, you know, when they opened the door of the plane, the first thing you smelt was your manure burning out there, yeah. taking care of that. And that was, uh, that was the first impression. Then I looked around and it was all very dry, hot, damp, wet, you know. Humid. Humid, that was the biggest thing. Humidity would just about kill you over there by the middle of the day. Yeah. <laughs> All right, now we're, did they run you through the repo depot or did you have an assigned unit? No, I, uh, when I got there, everybody went to a school for a week, seven days, where they taught you what you can and can't do, supposedly. Uh, you're not supposed to shoot their buffalo, you're not supposed to kill the people of the village, but a lot of times that changed. Yeah. And then, the, what year and month is this? This is in, the, uh, the, in uh, September, October, uh, and then in, in December of of 67 and went into 68. Into 68. And what unit are you assigned to? Well, uh, I went to, as I was waiting there, when I got my, after we went through the seven day class and we got out of there, they give you your, they cut your first set of orders. And then this guy told me, he said, go up there and stand by that Kwanzaa hut, there'll be a helicopter by to pick you up. And sometime, we can't tell you, sometime today. So I went up there and sat down and was waiting there, waiting, and come lunchtime. And the sergeant came out and said, come on, let's go to lunch. I said, well, what about my, he said, it'll be here when you get back. And I said, okay. So we got in the Jeep and went down at eight and then we came back. I sat back down there, two o'clock came, no helicopter yet. And uh, this per colonel pulled up in the Jeep and he uh, got up. I, as soon as I saw him, I stood up and saluted him. Set back down, he went in the Quonset and he was cussing coming out the door about five minutes later. And he got in the Jeep and the Jeep wouldn't start. <laughs> and so I got up and I said, sir, can I give you a hand? And he said, you know anything about it? I said, well, I kind of grew up around machinery and all my life at home. And he said, <coughs> have at it. So I jumped in there and got it started for him. He just flooded it, but I didn't tell him that. <laughs> and so he looked at me and said, what's your MOS? I said, well, it says I'm a combat medic. He said, hmm, 
I can change that. I said, sir, he said, I'm going to take you down to the motor pool. So he opened the screen door of the Kwanzaa hut, hollering in, Sergeant, hold this guy's helicopter. I'm going to take him to the motor pool. And so we got in the Jeep. He drove down to the motor pool. It was about a mile away. And he got out in there, talked to the motor captain. He come out and said, go talk to that captain in there. So I went in there. And he asked me some questions. Do you know how to do this? Do you know how to do that? Well, yes, sir. Uh, well, prove it. Go out there and take the brakes off that Jeep. And so where's the tools? And he said, you'll find some out there. So I went out there, jacked it up, pulled the wheels off of it, took the brakes off. And I was fixing to walk around to the other side, and he came out and said, stop. said, you know what the hell you're doing. <laughs> so uh, I put it all back together. We went back up. He, he talked to the motor captain while I waited in the Jeep, and he took me back over there. And when we got up to the, um, when we got up to the Kwanzaa hut, he opened the screen door up, and the helicopter's sitting there idling, waiting on me. And he said, send that helicopter on this guy, stand here, process him in with us. And so... You know, I kind of, well, wow, what have I got myself into? And so I, uh, uh, they put me, give me a place to stay in the motor pool. We stayed right in the motor pool with, you know, Kwanzaa, a hooch. And uh, the next morning in the chow line, this sergeant come up to me and says, good thing you didn't get on that helicopter. And I said, why do you say that? He said, because it was shot out and everybody was killed. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> so what a what a rude awakening, you know, when, yeah. for somebody that's 20 years old, going into a combat zone, not knowing anything about being in combat. So, you know, I kind of rededicated my life, went to my hooch and prayed about it and rededicated my life. I said, Lord, I'll do whatever you want, but I want to go home. So... I got my first duties. The sergeant come out and said, well, you know, we got to do this, we got to do that. So I went, so let's get to it. So I started doing my duties in the motor pool. And uh, What outfit was this? This was the 85th Evac Hospital. Uh-huh. And uh, they were an a, a emergency hospital with a 60-bed hospital, and they were People that got wounded came. No, they flew. well, they took care of all our wounded from <laughs> the Idrang Valley in '65. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. So, 225 casualties in one day. Uh, I, I, maybe I ought to back up, but when we got over there, most of the people on that airplane that we went over there with uh, were all combat medic guys. I'd been to school with them. There was like three classes. There was like 120 in these three classes. And there was 96 in our class. And when I got ready to come home, all were killed except four of us. Whoa. In that year and two months or so that I was there. So it was, you know, I, over the years, while we were, I was working and it was just, Overwhelming every day. I pick up the, the the newsletter, you know, KIA and missing in action, killed as a result of non-combat, you know, and and it was, it was Incredible. amazing, you know, that here you're the second medic who has told me that story of yeah. flying over the yep. Navy corpsman. Yep. 120 of them flew over, and three months later, this guy and 12 others are all that's left yep. alive. Yep. My bunkmate got killed uh, a few months after I was there, and uh, I wrote his wife a letter. I didn't bring it with me, I should have, but uh, she wrote me the nicest letter. They'd only been married for a little over two months, a month and a half, when he got drafted, and he went over there, and she loved him to death, and you know, some of the stories she told me about him. But it was, it was so tragic for young people to be sent over there and uh, but it's war, you know, and when you're, the you first have, guy that yeah. dies is the medic. That's right. They look. They always look for that medic. That's why I tried not to look like the one. The medics and second <laughs> lieutenants and <laughs> photographers. Yes, they all have to do their work yeah. standing up. Yep. Well, so you know, in the motor pool, I had duties, and I was real busy. We were always doing, and we always had to go pick up our medical supplies for the for the whole hospital at a depot, which was about 20 miles away. Well, we had to, we had to 
get our jeeps and 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 then we get in a convoy. We had a we had one 105 a tank with 105 on it and two uh, for quad 50 that were stayed behind and brought up the tail section. And uh, so we go load up from the motor pole. The guys in the motor pole had to go get this equipment or any any anything we needed. They would supply it. We would pick it up. Yeah. Except the only thing I you know, what got me was they could do they could. Uh, Bring all the beer in with the Chinook helicopters on but the hanging up. Medical but no medical, no medical supplies would they bring. Uh, so we had to go get that. Doesn't that and, sound army and, to you? Yeah, yeah. So that's the way they do things. <laughs> but it was, you know, we, we'd have to go through these little two little hamlets to get over there, go across the big mountain to get over there. It took us all day to get over there. Well, we got over there. We stayed over there at night, that night, and the next day we now, came back. Now, the 85th at that point is in Quinion? That was in Quinion. That yeah. is correct. Yes, we were in Quinion. And so uh, after two and a half, three months went by, this colonel came to me and uh, said, I have a job for you, and if you can do it, says, I'll make you a buck sergeant, and I was a PFC. <clears throat> so he said, we're gonna move the hospital up to Fubai. And uh, I said, well, how many men? He says, any men that you want, we'll, we'll get you all the manpower. But he said, first, we gotta bring these connexes in. I want you to load everything, label each connex, what's in that connex, and get You're it ready. You're moving the motor pool? Every, no, the whole no, hospital. the whole hospital. The whole hospital. See, the 67th, the back was right beside us, and they decided they were getting more casualties up on the north end up by the DMZ, Fubai Way, and uh, so they wanted to get more uh, hospital to keep from having to fly the guys that got wounded all the way out to the ship yeah. 10 miles off the coast. It would be much quicker to bring them there. And so the 85th of Act, we moved everything. We got it on. I got everything loaded. And in six weeks, I had it ready. We shut the hospital down, and then we got everything loaded in the LST boat, ship, and uh, along with all of our deuce and house, our trucks, our jeeps, our ambulances, and uh, we went north. He'd make you a sergeant? He, when we got up there, I got everything put back together. Yes, sir, he made me a sergeant. And he, when I, he and I became good friends <laughs> until he left. You know, it was, it was amazing. So you here you are trained to be a medic <laughs> and you're the motor pool sergeant. Yep, I was a motor pool sergeant. But I f forgot left out one thing I want to tell you about real quick. While we were there, one night they were having a you know they had the bands come and play and the and the girls get up and dance. Well, I didn't I wasn't going to go there but I could hear them over there playing, but I decided to stay in my hooch there and write some letters home because we didn't know where we were going to be and I was going to tell them about it. We were going to be moving. And as I sit there and write a letter, I kept hearing this distinct sound that I knew what that sound was, but I couldn't figure out where it was coming from. And so I, uh, I uh, got up, went outside, and as soon as I walked outside, I heard it again. So I went back, and the guys in there always had their M16s, right? So I grabbed an M16, put a clip in there, and pulled one in the chamber. And I walked outside, and it was real moonlit, and it was clear. And so I got down on the ground, look, and I could see way down. We had, we had 18 deuce and a half, or two and a half ton trucks. And uh, so I could see something way down on the far end. And so I, I got down on the ground and watched, and it was two sets of barefoot people walking. And they would walk around the other side of the truck, and then I could hear that, and that, then I knew what it was. They were putting grenades in our fuel tanks. Oh. It was the VC, they had come across five rows of Constantina wire got in the motor pool and they were putting grenades in the in the fuel tanks well what do you they do they have them they scotch put, taped or no, something they, put, they had a roll of regular electrical tape it was crude but it was electrical tape and so gasoline had melted but uh -oh. it give them a chance well to get first away. thing in the morning when you cranked it up and you moved that truck that that spoon would come off there because the tape would get eaten up with the gas or diesel or gas and uh, when you moved it blow up you yeah. know they would be, disintegrate a deuce and a half with 50 gallons of diesel. So, so I got down and I said, you know, I can't go get somebody. And I could hear the band over there playing a good ways away. And so I laid down underneath the last deuce and a half and got in, in front of the uh, tire on the inside of the chassis of the truck. And I waited for them to come around that. When they come around there, I emptied 
my clip of the two. Of course, then we were on full alert, you know. And the, the, did you have to go fish the grenades out well, of the Well, the tanks? EOD team came and did that. But <laughs> we, you know, they want to know, well, what's all the shooting? And so I had to, so there's two dead VC over there. You can see them. They, all they had on was bandolier grenades, no clothes. They were huh. buck naked. Huh. And uh, so they, the next, that and all that night, they fished grenades out of fuel tanks and gasoline tanks, you know, and the Jeeps and things. But, you know, it was, it was me or them, you know, because yeah. all they had to do was pull one grenade and throw it at me and I'd been dead. Yeah. So, you know, they and uh, so, that, but that, that's, I wanted to tell you that, but, you know, the, you, so you then we got a medal for that. <laughs> <laughs> it's part of my duties is what they told me. Uh, but anyway, we went ahead and, and uh, we went up, got on the ship, and, and I went with the, all the supplies and the jeeps and the, the trucks and the LSD boat. We went up to up to Fubai, and that's where we set up the new hospital. And that's when he made me a, the buck sergeant. He came out one morning and said, "I got something for you," and he gave me the the stripes. He said, "Get them sewn on today." I said, "Yes, sir. I'll do that." <laughs> but you know, then. Uh, about three weeks later, after we got everything set up, about three weeks after that, he came to me one day, he says, I, got, I have to do something and I don't want to do it. And I said, well, what's that? He said, I said, you have to do what they tell you to do. He said, I'm gonna let you go back and be a medic. Our medics are getting killed so fast that could not supply the medics. All the medics were just about gone. And so there, he says, you go across the runway there and there's 101st Airborne. Uh, uh, you see this sergeant over there, tell him I sent you over there and you're gonna be one of their medics. And so I went over there and talked to him. He said, well, where's your gear? I said, it's across the runway. So he took me back over there and get, get my gear. And when we came back and he said, well, I said, uh, I have alert team It's needing a medic right now. They are going on a mission tomorrow. And here's, uh, here's the sergeant, here's the lieutenant and uh, Take plenty of gear with you of what you might need because you'll probably be out there for a couple of weeks before you get back. I said, okay. So I went over there and met with them. Next morning at 7 o'clock, the choppers were waiting on us. And we took off and we went over in the Ashaw Valley. And you know where that's at. Yep. Over by the Ho Chi Minh Trail over there. And uh, they dumped us off over there in sawgrass about 10 foot off the ground, and it, it, well, they came in hot, so jump. So we, we jumped out. We had this one kid, he'd never been in combat, and he jumped out right by me. I said, just stay with me. Uh, I didn't tell him I had never been in combat, but <laughs> I figured I could help him out if he, and so I jumped, and, and we all jumped off of each side of the helicopter, and we had the sergeant, he had told me before we left there, he said, you need to listen for my whistle. He said, when I whistle, you come to me. And so, okay, Lieutenant, Lieutenant, uh, you know, he didn't say anything, didn't tell me anything. He said, keep your head down, that was about it. So we- uh, For our For, viewers, our, for my uh, squad, mm. and this squad was made up of five American soldiers, Lieutenant, a Sergeant, and the other three guys, and myself was a medic. And the rest of the guys were just guys that were that were on the LERP team, and, uh, uh, and then we had. For our viewers, explain what LERP means. That's a long range recon patrol that goes out, and we we have we do whatever they ask us to do. Sometimes we would observe the enemy. Sometimes we have to make contact with them, but they wanted us to stay as discreet as we could and and sneak around in and amongst them, and we go to the Ho Chi Minh Trail and where they were gonna drop the bombs, they put a little marker out. Well, that bomb would hone in on that 500 pounder when it was coming to the ground, and they knew exactly where it was gonna hit. Yeah. They told us where to put the, the markers, and we did it, and then we'd sneak out, get out of there. We it did was a lot sneaky of, peating, mostly. Yep, yep, that's what we were. And uh, Now, so, were you assigned permanently to this LERP team? No, I was a TDY. Just that one no, mission? No. No? No, I was. TDY to them until I came home. Oh! So I went with a lot of missions with them, a lot of missions. Uh, but it was, 
it's quite a, quite an experience. Uh, your first time or your tenth time, everything was different each time. Yeah, you know, different the terrain. Uh, we were on a mission one time, and they they said uh, we were going to observe this one hooch that was in the middle of a little hamlet there. And they said, watch that. They they think that the the VC have a weapons cache in there. So we watched it for two days, and we could see these old mamasons and men hauling rice in there in their bags, and they, they would go in there, and in just a minute, they'd be gone. That hooch can't hold that much rice or the weapons. They see some weapons going in there, and you can't, you can't be that much room in there. They had a hole in the ground there, and it's going down there, and so we had, we had to observe that, and then they'd sent, they sent a, uh, uh, a bomber in there, B-52, and they took it out. And once they did, we had to go back and check it out, make sure it was do uh, a BDA. Yep. Yeah. Did you find what you were looking for? Oh yeah, there was probably three tons of rice and uh, AK-47s. There was a like, two weapons caches there of those in there, brand new, still in the boxes. Cosmoline, never been shot. Mm -hmm. Where they were bringing them from the Ho Chi Minh Trail over there, putting them in there when they needed them, they would come back and get them. Yeah. So, so we, we took care of that. Now, I, I know what your living conditions are like <laughs> in the field, but when you were back in the rear, which I don't suppose was very long between missions, no. uh, what were living conditions like there? Well, I went back to the hooch that I was, was in with the uh, other because they didn't have a room over at the 101st. So, so you're I, back to the motor pool. I'm back to the motor pool to stay. When we were in there, I would go back over there and stay in the hooch that I had my stuff in. They put you back to work on the Jeeps? Once in a while, but a lot of times we had been out for you know days and they, they let us sleep. Yeah. We'd get get kind of caught up. We'd be out sometimes five days. The highest I was out like 31 days without coming back. Whoa. And uh, they, uh, they, every time we try to get resupplied with ammunition, water, food, medical supplies, they drop, they drop these slars with a parachute on it and we come down all the time. We got to it in the mountains there. It was thick jungle. BC had already gotten to it and the only thing was left was a slar. With the stuff with the supplies were in, there was nothing left. Uh. They, they took everything out of it. So we didn't get a lot of, so we had to drink water out of a cow track or out of the stream where you would, uh, you would get uh, dysentery. Dysentery, we put the pills in it and then I said, that's all I got, you know, so you give them the pills and we put it in the water. And yeah, you know, they got dysentery. When we, we were in the, in the creeks and in the streams and uh, we'd get leeches on us and have to get those off. And you know, it's, that's, a, that's a task for somebody. That was my job. The guys would come and say, well, I got something on me, and I don't know what it is. Well, as soon as I saw it, I knew it was a leash, and you get a guy with smoked and put a cigarette on it, he turned loose, you get him off. <laughs> Describe your friendships with and your impressions of the troops that you were working with, with? on these missions. Uh, the good, there was a good bunch of guys. The, the lieutenant wouldn't listen a lot of the time. Uh, the sergeant was the one who kept us straight. He was the one, he, this was his third tour. In fact, I have his knife here that uh, he gave me uh, before we, last time that we saw him. Uh, he got killed, mm -hmm. but uh, he gave me his knife. I don't know why he gave it to me, but I, I've treasured it just to hold on to it because it has his name on the back. But uh, he, he, he kept us straight. We knew, he knew what we needed to do and how to get it done. And he was one that loved to use a knife. He would, if we got in a firefight, y'all stay here, I'll be right back. And first thing, he'd be gone. Wow, where's he going? And then the shooting would stop. And he'd come walking back there and he said, huh, we, we can go now. I said, well, what'd you do? He said, I cut all their throats. <laughs> that's what he, he loved to do. I mean, that's. He was from Kentucky, a farm boy, and he knew how to get the job done, and nobody got killed that way. Mm. So. Did you form friendships with men from different racial and social backgrounds? Oh, yes, yes. 
Uh, I was a, a friend with a Korean, he was in the army, uh, the Korean army, and uh, I got to be good friends with him. He was, he was, a, he was a machine gunner. He, carried like a 60 caliber machine gun. He, could, he carried all the ammo and the other guy carried the machine gun. And I got to be good friends with him. And uh, he, he and I talked about, you know, what our lives were different, how different they were and where he, where he grew up and what he did. And I told him about my, my life. And he really was enthused about what, you know, in America, the way we did things and the way they couldn't do it over there. It was, you know, and, and we we became friends, and I'd see him every every time I we would get in, and he would, uh, we would, we would talk a little bit, and then I came in one time, and they said, oh, that that sergeant over there has something for you, and I said, well, what is it? And he said, I don't know. You have to see. It. It's in wrapped up. So I got it, and this guy had given me his one of his badges off his uniform, and uh, he got killed on the next mission. Whoa. And so I treasure that, you know, he, he and I were friends, but he was from over in uh, Korea and, uh, you know, and I, I, other guys, a couple of guys that lived, uh, that were from the States that uh, one guy lived in Alabama, I got to be friends with him and uh, he got bitten by a bamboo viper Ooh. and on one of our missions and he was, you know, you don't have a chance with that. They call him Two-Step Charlie. Yeah. And when you get bitten by those, you usually take two breaths and your tongue swells up, you die. Mm -hmm. Did your status as a conscientious objector affect the way that you were treated by the people you worked and lived with? Uh, or did they know? They knew. They knew. I told them. I told them I was a SEAL and they wanted to know what that was. And I told them, you know, I was a conscientious objector, but. I would protect my life if I had to, you know, and then in cases, and they, they understood, they understood, you know, what? Hell, what you're was. over there with them. That's right, I was, I, was, I was the one protecting them when they got wounded or got, got shot, but, uh, you know, they, a uh, couple of them, you know, had a little animosity because, oh, you don't have to carry a gun. No, I don't have to carry a gun, but it's good to have one once in a while. And then, and, and in some of the situations that we got in, but, but I never, I had a 38 that when I first got over there, this, when I got on the LERP team, one of the guys was coming off of his duty and he said, here, you can have this thing, I'm going home. So uh, he said, here, have this 38. And it was a military issued to the pilots of uh, the Air Force. And he said, you can have it, I don't need it. We can't take it out of country, here, you keep it. And so I kept it the whole time I was there and when I got ready to leave, I did the same thing. I passed it on. Passed it along. Passed it along, yes. Now, at this time, back in the States, there's, there's anti-war protests, there's racial riots and tensions and all that going on. Does any of that come over to Vietnam where you are? Yeah, some of the guys that had come in from the States would talk about it, but I didn't want to hear it. I told them, I said, look, we're over here to do a duty and a job that we have to get, we have to do. And uh, I don't want to hear about it, you know. When I got back to the States, I found out what it was, you know. Mm -hmm. Whenever my folks came to pick me up at the airport, there were some hippies out there sitting, four of them sitting there, two girls, two boys. And they were sitting there when they saw me come out in my uniform, they got up and spit on them. My dad went, um, he was going to knock their block off and I said, Daddy, no, don't do anything. Just uh, leave them alone because they, won't, they don't know what, they don't know what war's about. They don't know, understand about it. For freedom, if they went to these other countries and saw how freedom really worked here in the U.S., change their tune. Uh, how much time off did you have for rest and recreation or anything like that? Not a lot. Not a lot. Not a lot. Alert team was had to be on a standby ready to go. And if we got a call or had to go something, you know, sometime we had 10 minutes to get our stuff together and, and leave. But, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I associated with some of the guys. We went to, to uh, like over to Da Nang, a couple of days we were off, we'd go over to Da Nang and go to the beach and, uh, and swim and cut up. And, 
the guys would drink. I never drank, but they, they would drink. And I was, a, I was what they call the designated driver home. <laughs> <laughs> they, they knew they could get home with me. So. Can you describe any memorable holidays during your tour? Christmas, Thanksgiving? Uh, military tried to make it tolerable for us. They, they, would, uh, they would have a nice Thanksgiving. They would have turkey. They have everything you want. Uh, it wasn't the same as being at home, but they were trying. They were trying. USO would try. Uh, I stayed mostly in contact with my family through tapes and letters. Mom, my mother was a, a great typist, and she would type these letters that were five pages long. You know, but Mom, my goodness, you know, you don't have to make it so long. But she was letting me know. I was into NASCAR racing, and so she would let me know what was going on, or send me clippings of, of, <laughs> of races here at Daytona or wherever. But you know, it was, it was joy to get something like that or maybe some cookies that were a couple of weeks old, but they were, they were still from home when they were homemade. So, so for the rest of your tour after the right. EVAC I, hospital, yeah. you, you really were up there I working would, I, out of Fubai with yeah, the 100 out of Fubai over to uh, oh, Pleiku. We were in Pleiku. Uh, we were at uh, Hill 861. Well, they got overrun there uh, one night. Uh, we were on a mission, and we kept hearing this fire base off in the distance with 105s going off and 155s. So Lieutenant said, let's try to make it to that fire base because they'd already called us and said the cloud cover was so low that we could they could not come and pick us up. So it would be the, the next day before they would come and get us. And so uh, the Lieutenant said, let's see if we can make it to that fire base. Well, it was up there, we were down here, and we had to find us a way to get around up to it. So we, we, uh, we found a way, it took us till dark, this was at three o'clock, and at dark at 6.30 or so at night, we had just made it there. So this uh, fire base was six 105s and, and five 155s, on top of a, just a top of a mountain. And uh, they had just bulldozed it off and put Constantina wire up, and that was it. It was straight down all the sides except one. And so we, he said, we don't have any place for you to live or stay while you're here. Well, we don't care. At least we're inside, the, in, inside where their, the fire base was at. They said, well, at 7.30, we're going to be shooting for 30 minutes. So you know, be sure you put your earplugs in, stay behind us at all times. We were gonna be, they were going to be doing some fire missions off in the distance. So we did. And... After that, at 8.30 at night, all of a sudden we heard all this hollering and screaming and everything. What is that, you know? So, and by that time, the, con the VC uh, were coming up over and the first of these guys would come and lay down on the Constantina wire and then another one lay on top of him until they got the mess Constantina wire down where the guys could get through and they get, walk get inside. They over their bodies. But you know what? They never fired one bullet. They put, had their bayonets on there and they started stabbing everybody. Mm. And so if you, once I saw that, I got in a low spot and two dead, two our guys were shooting their ammunition like crazy trying to kill all of them to come. And uh, they, they couldn't do it. And so I, got, I laid down and there was mats that the, that the tanks were sitting on. There was a low spot on one side and I got down in that low spot and two dead VC were right here on me. And so I dragged them over there on top of me and laid there all night with those dead VC on me and their blood was running on me and everything. And I, I guess the VC thought they, they, or they were shooting parachute in the little fire things that come down where they could see what was going on. And so at five o'clock the next morning, it all stopped. Somebody blew a whistle. Some of their people blew a whistle and they were gone back in the mountain, this thing was full of, this whole mountain was full of like beehive inside. They, they overrun and they, killed everybody on there? No, they overrun us, but we killed uh, uh, probably 55 before our guys started getting wounded. And uh, so there was four of our guys, there was, there was 29 people total on the fire base. And four of them got killed, some of them were wounded but it was like 50 or 60 of the other guys of VC that were black pajamas were killed. Mm. But uh, we, we survived it. Everybody said, well, how, how did you feel? How did you feel a, a dead VC on you? 
if they gave me cover. And they would, they would ban it every time they'd come by. A wave of them would come over, they'd go off the other side, and there'd be another wave coming up. And so that's, that's how, and I stayed alive that way. <laughs> so. There's a nightmare for you. Well, yeah, but uh, you know, at least I was alive. Uh, that was a thing. The Lord protected me, I know he did. Many Can you times. describe the quality of the leadership that of that unit as far up as you could see it? I knew the colonel. He was a fair person. He knew, he knew what was, was bad, what was good. And I really appreci appreciated him and the way he leaded, led out in our, our troops at, uh, in, in the motor pool and on the base there of, of the 85th Evac Hospital. And uh, it, was, it was amazing that, uh, that he knew so much for being over there. And he, this was his second tour over there, so he knew. I, you know, I appreciated that. Was he so, a medical service guy? Uh, yes, yeah. yes, he was medical. But uh, I knew that uh, some of these, uh, some of these other ones that we had, the, the leadership, were never had never been in combat before. You could tell it; they were, they were not seasoned people or not somebody that knew what was going on. You know. What about the leadership in the hundred and first over that, on that, that was side? Different. That was a different breed. That was a different. You know, they knew what to do. They knew how to do it, how to get it done, and that was really my eye opener when I got with the hundred and first. Yeah, but it, you know, a lot of this stuff because we went into Laos over in the Cambodia. I I feel like that some of this stuff was never, never told, or you know, maybe. They, what they call whitewash your, your records. Yeah. Uh, it was never, you know, some of the, uh, I just don't feel like that we- Sheep dip your There records. you go. That's a good one for it. <laughs> but we did, we did what we had to do to survive, you know, but it was. Talk about your most vivid memories of your time in Vietnam. Tell me about the worst day you had during your whole tour. The day I got wounded. Okay. <laughs> Tell me about it. Shrapnel. 81, like an 81 millimeter mortar. And they were shooting, firing in on us. We were in the, in the mountains there. There was two snipers, one in this, these trees, a line of trees over here. And there's another mountain over here. And there was a sniper, so they were doing this. They were shooting right above us or shooting at us. Uh, we had this one kid that would not wear his steel pot. And I t we kept telling him, put your steel pot on. He'd wear his high helmet liner because it was light, but the steel pot is heavy. I had mine here that, and I had a, a bullet went right across. It didn't go through, it, it glanced off. Yeah. And so I, I, I said, I'm taking that home. <laughs> that, <laughs> that thing saved my life. It saved my life, it did. But you know, there was, there was good and bad times. And uh, well, once I got the shrapnel, uh, I, and when I got to the, they took us to the hospital ship. Well, why, I don't know, but they did. And uh, instead of taking you to the 85th? Right, they did not. Your parent unit? Yeah, yeah, I'd love to have been there. They took us out there and here, the ship is 600 feet long and uh, they, uh, they tried to land in 10 foot seas. So you know how that is. So when we got on the deck of the ship, the chopper just dropped us and we were, they were gone. And uh, I was more sick from being seasick than I was. The shrapnel was there, but you know, but I, I met where, a lot of Where'd you get hit? All over. All over? Legs, back. Uh, how long you were, were you in that hospital? Six days and I was, raring to go. I said, you know, I need to get back with my unit. Do you remember the name of that ship? Hope. 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 This is my patches. Things I don't know if anybody's interested in that. So how many pieces of metal did they pull out of you? So I told, 
told him I wanted to keep my shrapnel. <laughs> I said, oh, this, mercy. The, 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 uh, the light oh, colonel. Hold that up can. for the camera. Yeah, just tell us about it. This piece here was in the back of my leg here. Yeah. That piece right there, I can tell you where they all came from, was in my calf up here. And uh, it was had gone in this way and was sticking out. Mm. And I, but I couldn't pull it out. It was just too jagged. Too jagged. It wanted to stick in. This one here was in the, my shoulder back here. And uh, that piece there was a ricochet. And you uh. see it? It was a ricochet and bullet that was had come apart. And, uh. Uh, it, it, it rained in, the, in, the, in my lower part of my leg right here. Yeah. So, but but they, you only stayed six days and you were ready to get out of there. Oh, yeah. My goodness, I was more sick from being seasick than I was from being hurt. <laughs> I could have tolerated this, you know. If I could have gotten them out, I would probably <coughs> stay with my guys. Stayed in the field. Stayed in the field, yes, sir. In a, the good old Red Cross. You know, they give you the little bag when you, get, you go in there, you get toothbrush, bar soap. And yeah. So I, I kept it. But this, I said, I want my shrapnel. So. Oh. Is that all they took out or that just all they gave you? That time, that's all they gave me. Yeah. So that was a pretty good bad day. Tell me now about the, this oh is my. More. That's a this different. Is another time. Oh, another, Lord. This is another time. So, uh. This was sticking out of my bottom of my shoe. Had gone in this way and was sticking out the bottom of my shoe. This was in my front part of my leg here. What's that piece. from? I don't know what this one was. Mortar? It, it, was, it had to be a big one because this piece here. Yeah, that's huge. It, uh, that probably a 122 rocket is what I, you know. That one hit you anywhere the, above the belt. You're dead, man. You're dead. But all these pieces that they took out of me, never hit a vital lot of artery that missed it. <laughs> That's why I say the Lord was on my he side. He was on your <laughs> side, yeah, I'd say. Yeah, sir. Tell me about the best day you had oh, in your tour. The day I walked up that steps going back, getting on that plane to go home. Getting on the plane to go home. Yes, You'd sir. be surprised how many people say that. Yep. There was 300 guys on that plane and it was dead silence. Till you got to the point where the pilot said, you're out of Vietnam now. Yes, and everybody was hooping and hollering. <laughs> and Did you have any contact or much contact with any of our allies, the Koreans, the Australians, the New Zealanders, Filipinos, Thais? The Mountain Yard people. The Mountain Yard. The Mountain Yard people. They were, they were there with us. They would guide us through the mountains to tell us where to go and, and what to do and don't do this and watch out there's a punji pit up here. And that was, that was, they were the best. They were little short people. They were four and a half foot tall, but they could get places that you couldn't. They could go in a tunnel. They could tell us what was in there. And we could either blow it up or have the bombers come and take care of it. Mm. It was, they were wonderful people. Now, were they working for you? Yes. Or working they were, for special they forces? Were, they were, we had a, one Ottoman guy that spoke their language. He was, uh, uh, and, and he would go with us and this one, uh, mountain yard guy and so he would tell this Arvin would tell ask him a question and he'd tell us what was up here don't go there that was really a help to us if yeah. you have anything much to do with the South Vietnamese army the yes. Arvin yep Arvins yes yep. what, what would you think of them they were good they were good of course you have good and bad but I, you know, the the good ones, you got to know which ones were the good ones and which ones not to, because they were kind of like the BC th sympathizers. They would work with both of you. If yeah. they, and, and we had a couple, one day in the motor pool, I saw this Arvin guy go up to the fence. He turned and started pacing back towards the trucks. Uh, 
And I thought, what is he up to? And then it hit me. He's measuring off how many feet it is. And then he'll go on the outside when he gets off today and step it off on out to where they want to. Tell them where the mortars ought to put come Place down. those mortars. Yes, sir. Yeah. But they was good ones. Those was good ones. We, when, you know, the ones that was with us all the time uh, when we were on a mission, they were good. They stuck with us. They helped us out any way they could. I've worked on a couple of them that got shot. That uh, One of them made it. The other one didn't make it. But I patched them up to where they could make it to the hospital. How much news did you get about the war that you're fighting in? <sighs> Stars and Stripes, Armed uh, Forces, yeah. Radio. Well, listen to the radio when we had it, you know, when we were in. Uh, read some of the papers. That's how I kept up with the guys that was the, the medics that got killed. You know, when they, you, you always want to know about your fellow guys that you spent night and day with for 16 weeks while you were training. Uh, I, uh, I, I really, they, they just were, were super, super people to, to work with, uh, the Arvins and the, not the Viet Cong, <laughs> or the, but you know, they, they, were, they were good, they were good, so. Now, tell me about that great day when you walked up the, walked up that ramp and uh, onto the plane going home. Were you surprised you made it? Uh, yes, sir, I was. As, as the many times that I was working on, I, I would just, when I sit down in the seat and, and buckled up, when they said, well, you need to buckle your seat belt, you know, you start thinking about all the things that go through your mind as to how the Lord protected me, uh, and these other guys that I knew didn't get to come home that way. They went home in the box, you know, so to speak. But it was, uh, I was really grateful, and, and when I got back to the States, I actually got out, I mean all the guys got out and kissed the ground because we were glad to be home. Glad where, to be where did you land at? Well, they took us from Cameron Bay, where I came into, and we went from there to Yokota, Japan, from Yokota, Japan, to Seattle, Washington. Seattle, Tacoma. Seattle. And it was freezing cold in Seattle, raining, but we still got out and kissed the ground. A lot of the guys did. Put their feet you, back on the soil. Were you done with the Army at that point? Yes, sir, uh, because they kept me there the extra time not let me go home after the 12 months. Uh, they said, you know, this, this is the only way you can do it. They said, we can't let you go home because there's nobody to replace you. Yeah. And all these, so, you know, I was done. So they gave me my, my uh, uniform and I didn't care, you know, I was ready to go home. And, and uh, so I, I flew from there to, to uh, Chicago, from Chicago to Orlando. And, mm. uh, but I would, uh, I would do it again. Did uh, did you run into any demonstrators or anybody? Only when we came out of the airport that uh, they were spitting on me. And uh, my dad wanted to cold cock them. I said, no, daddy, it'll just get you in trouble. Come on, let's go. We'll on. end up in jail. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, they put you in jail. But uh, so I, we, we came home and to a quiet homecoming, my brother, he, he came home and uh, we we talked and uh, and then I I went back to my went down to my old job at the funeral home bombing uh, people and uh, Don says oh come on your job's here you, you, we're gonna send you to school now you're finished with that stuff and and so I uh, I worked down there two weeks and I couldn't do it anymore I just could not do it uh, I tried you know and it was it was just some of the things that I had witnessed and seen in Vietnam, the killing of kids, uh, you having to kill kids because they're, they're holding a grenade and, and throwing it at you. We had a Jeep one time that the guy, we were on one of our missions to go, go pick up the supplies at the depot. And I told the guy, I said, now, he want, kept on, let me drive, let me drive. I said, okay, I'm gonna let you drive. But if I tell you, you keep your hand on the fuel tank cap. Do not take it off. I'll shift the gears for you. 
you just push the clutch in and I'll put it in the next gear. And he said, okay, okay. So we got, we got all the way out almost to the depot and uh, I noticed, uh, I looked over there and he had both hands on the steering wheel. I said, jump, jump. There's gonna be a grenade in here, you know. I jumped out and he didn't. And that gas tank went up. I got a picture of the Jeep and it's just, he was dead. It wasn't enough harder to pick up. Darwinism. No. He, he didn't listen to you. He would not listen. Younger, the kids that were coming behind us, that were kids, would not listen to us. And if you're there and you know something, you always, we would pass it on, try to pass it on. And that's, that's what got they me. They don't listen, they die. They die. You don't get a second chance. No, you do not. <coughs> What'd you do after you quit the funeral home? Well, I put my application in with Orlando Utilities, the power company, and with, with uh, Florida Power Corporation and with the telephone company. And the second day I turned, turned my application in, the second day I got a call from Orlando Utilities and said, we well, understand you just got back from the service and you're looking for a job. I said, yes, sir, I am. He said, well, come down and let's talk. So I went down and talked. He said, well, you may not like the job. He said, but it pays a whole dollar and 75 cents an hour. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I went down there, I said, I'll take it. And it was mowing right of ways on the power lines, the big power lines. And so I started with early in utility. Dollar seventy five an hour? Yep. That's was all. that minimum that was wage? 19, that was in nineteen seventy. Yeah. And I'm still working for the Orlando Utilities. <laughs> I work fifty. I've I been, hope they're paying you more than a buck <laughs> seventy five. Oh yes, oh yes. Uh, yeah. I, you know, we, my wife and I were looking at some of the old pay stubs that I, I've kept that she has kept, I should say. Uh, but I started for a dollar seventy five and you know what? I was making $40 an hour when I retired. That was been 10 years ago, but they called me back in because I was the only old guy that knew where the stuff was buried, especially the underground stuff. And so I've been working with them on I-4 for all this time, trying to keep them from getting into our oil fill pipe cables. <laughs> but enjoyed it, love it. I'm a transmission lineman and uh, Work anything hard. So you retired off of it and then went back as a consultant? I went back as a, as a standby consultant, yes. Yeah. Because nobody, nobody's left there that knows where the stuff is. They all. If you're the only guy who knows, double <laughs> your wage. They got to pay yeah. you. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. Good company to work for. <laughs> Do you have difficulty readjusting to civilian life after a year in combat? Uh, well, one day you're killing somebody, and the next day you're you're back here in the states. Yeah, it was a little adjustment, not not bad. But I learned that if you talk about your incidences you had, and it helps me through some of the bad times that you were over there and were down. And I I'll, I'll I'll talk about. It. I may get teary. I may, but I'm human, and I can I can you can come back from it. But it, it took me a little adjustment, but uh, within a couple months, I was fine. Yeah. So, yeah. And you're believers, so you're not gonna go the alcohol and drugs oh, route. Oh, no, no. I've never drank or smoked in my life. And I'm going to fix the turn 73. <laughs> have you uh, had much or any contact with guys that you served with over there? No. Uh, there was only four of us that came home, and out of those four, there's only two of us left. And I've lost contact with the other guy. I don't know where he moved, and I do not know where he's at. But uh, no, I don't, I don't keep up with them. I go to, when we have the traveling wall, I'll go and maybe I'll run into somebody that knew somebody that uh, was there. But, yeah. You know, I, uh, we uh, did a week of interviews with the 85th EVAC hospital really? docs, nurses, and techs a year ago in D.C. They were having a reunion. Uh -huh. And uh, they were the people from 1965-66. Really? Who had taken care of our cavalry wounded out of the Idrang battles. And uh, I entered, I did those interviews. They were wow. amazing people. No, they but were good. A lot of them 
are very haunted by the memories. Yeah, yeah. Some of the nurses would, uh, when I was on the hospital ship, the, the, not the male nurses, but the female nurses would see these guys come in and just break down, you know. And you try to comfort them as well as keep them uplifted. But it, yeah. they had a job that I don't think I could have I either. couldn't handle that. I couldn't, because you come in there and they're, they're, they're shot up, they're blown away. Uh, and, and a lot of times you can't do anything for these guys that come in there like that with their leg gone. I had one that had his leg blown off. He stepped in a punji pit and he had his leg blown off and I couldn't even find his, his artery to clamp it to where I could keep him. And then within you know uh, three minutes after that, he was on his way out. Yeah. I gave him a morphine shot just to, to where he could relax, but yeah. Mm -mm -mm. But it was, it was something that I learned a lot in my life from that. And even this day, you think about people that you were with, how you took care of them, they took care of you. And uh, you know, I would do it again. If they called me, if I wasn't too old, I would do it again for our country. Thank you, sir, for You're coming welcome. in and sharing the story. Do you have any question that you'd like to ask him? No. Um, <laughs> he has said a lot of things that I've never heard before. <laughs> Some of the stories I have heard. And I will say that uh, you were asking him about him adjusting in life. We've been married over 40 years now, and we he has never had any nightmares or anything that kept him up or afraid after having been through that year over there. He's been blessed. God's t he looked after him totally. David? Um, Jim, how does it feel to express your experiences to your spouse, to me, to the people in this room. Uh, does it give you peace, comfort, some kind of resolution? Can I would move on easier <coughs> today. I wouldn't say it was it, it would make it any easier, but I feel like I should have I, I, what I told is uh, I, I like telling the story. I even have had told some stories to my friends that, that I experienced and they, they just can't believe it, that I made it through it, but I did. How did your Vietnam experience change you and affect your life afterward? Greatly. It was good. It was good. You, I have, over the years, the confidence in when you work on something or do something, even before that. but. But now, I enjoy doing things. You, Jan, my wife can tell you that. Uh, but I, you know, and and being with her, she's my life. She's my rock. And uh, it was. It, it's been. An, uh, I, I. I would do it again. I would do it again. I want to say thank you, Jim. Oh, for, you're welcome. For your service. I mean, that's a cliche that we hear a lot. But thank you for what you did for this country. And thank you for sticking your neck out. Wow. And uh, what you did is greatly appreciated by me and a lot of people. Thank you. Did your time in Vietnam affect the way you think about troops coming back from the wars today? Yes. You have to give them space. This, this new type of... Uh, war that they're doing now with the IEDs, those guys, you know, we kind of knew we were in a place, but those guys, they get blown away and, and they survive, but what they have to go through life and, and, and having to readjust to everything. They have to have special legs, arms, and a home where they can come to. And, and they're being blown up by cell phones. Right, these people, they don't don't care over there. They have no respect for life. So how do, how do you think the Vietnam War is remembered in our society today? To me, it was 
a political war. It was a political war, and uh, it uh, a lot of guys have some bad, bad, bad memories on it, over it, and their lives and their families pay for it. But uh, you know, I'm just glad that I did not come home with that chip on the shoulder, I guess you can call it, because I didn't. I felt like that each day that I was there, whatever I did, that uh, I was helping someone, and I would, any way that I could. Are there lessons that you took from your Vietnam service that you would like to pass along to the next generation? Uh, yes. Uh, be patient. People need, need to be patient with other people. And, and if, you, if you're not patient with them and kind to them and give them a little time and the respect, you're not going to make it. The, these people, the way the generations are today, they're totally different than when we grew up. Totally different. Yeah. Have you visited the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in D.C.? Oh, yes. I go and write, go and get the names of the guys that, that I grew up with here in Orlando, uh, and I respect them. I go to their graves at the cemetery where, where they are laid to rest there in Orlando, visit them. Uh, two of my best friends are there. You know, their families don't understand, uh, but you know, I talked with the one, the one uh, Keith Brown's sister, Sandy, his sister. She, she doesn't understand why why he was took, or, you know, but he he was doing what he was called to do. So, but he didn't he did not come home. You've heard about the 50th anniversary of the Vietnam War yeah. commemoration. Yeah. You're part of it today. Yes. <laughs> what do you think of that effort? I think it's good. You're letting people know what went on back then. It's good, and I, I feel privileged that. I got a chance to talk, tell my little story. We feel privileged <laughs> that you did too. Oh, well. So thank you for thank you.